what the message is about. It's about sacrifice. And then all aspect of it building up to giving that appropriate sacrifice. I so much appreciate that. So I'd ask you to put your hands together right now for Bishop John Smith, in Jesus' name. And we bless the Lord, everyone. Um, not all of the above titles really fit me, but <laughs> I'm John Smith. <laughs> God be the glory. Great things he has done. He is indeed wonderful. He has been the dearest friend that I've ever known. And I'm sure all of us can say the same. There is no friend like Jesus. Is that right? No friend like Jesus. Amen. It's been in my heart to share a song with you before I minister. The musicians aren't here, but nevertheless, I maybe can do. Are you the organist? Yes. Could you assist me? Yes. Um, I could do without the music, but it may just make me sound good if the music is playing. <laughs> Amen. While she's preparing, it's my pleasure to be here and to greet Bishop Cawley, who is on the premises but not in here just yet, to Elder Ricketts, delighted to be in your company again, sir, amen, to my good friend and brother, Bishop Bartlett, and Bishop Neville Clark, who is here, all the ministers and saints who are here, I greet you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise ye the Lord. God has been so good. So very good. Amen. The key of C should do me well. Praise God. Well. I have a friend. A precious friend. Oh, how he loves me. He says his love will never end. And oh, how he loves me. Why he should come I cannot tell Oh how He loves me In my poor broken heart to dwell Oh how He loves me he died to save my soul from death. Oh, how he loves me. I'll praise him while he gives me breath. Oh, how he loves me. Oh, how he loves me. Oh, how he loves me. I know not why. I only cry. Oh, how he loves me. walks with me along life's road oh how he loves me 
He carries every heavy load. Oh, how he loves me. I'll sing that verse again. Somebody may just need to hear it. He walks with me along life's road. Oh, how he loves me. He carries every heavy load. Oh, how he loves me. This is a promise to the church now. He has a home prepared for me. Oh, how he loves me. With him I'll spend eternity. Oh, how he loves me. Will you stand and sing it with me now? Oh, how he loves me. Oh, how he loves me. I know not why I only cry. Oh, how he loves me. Oh, how Jesus loves me. Oh, how Jesus loves me. I know not why I only cry. Oh, how he loves. Oh, how Jesus loves me. Oh, how Jesus loves me. I know not why I only cry, but oh, how Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so, little ones to him belong, they are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Oh, yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells. very sure that of all of us gathered here today and those who may be hearing us from outside or through technology of some sort none of us can ever say that we've done anything not even the smallest of things to deserve God's love. What a love. What a love. I am always broken and in awe when I think of how he loves me. My own evaluation of myself without him is not good, but with him 
it's very hopeful and bright. Hallelujah. Is there anybody who can testify like that? That with him. Hallelujah. 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 Oh, hallelujah. 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 The Lord bless you. You may be seated in the name of the Lord. Amen. Good to see Bishop Dalbert Clark coming in to join us. Amen. And we're going to get to the word of God for a few minutes. Um, we're going to begin with the what is oftentimes referred to as the golden text of the Bible, St. John chapter 3 and verse 16. St. John chapter 3 and verse 16. Let's go there, please. As Elder Ricketts mentioned earlier, concerning the simplicity of the sharing of the word, it is always my desire to share the word as simply as Jesus did. Amen. When Jesus shared the word, the common man was able to understand. And it is my desire that we be able to understand and thereafter apply the word of God to our lives. So St. John chapter 3 and verse 16, let's read it together please. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Can we do that one more time, please, together? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So, the first clause of that verse says, For God so loved the world. The dimension of his love cannot be adequately defined with words. So there is no descriptive word that we can put to it or no measurement that we can put to it to say, well, God love us this much or that much. But he so loved the world. And this world is not talking about the environment. It's talking about the people. And you'd never guess who that includes. <laughs> It includes all of us, you and I. God so loved the world. So if we wish, we could do a little interchanging of words and change the word world and personalize it. For God so loved me. Hallelujah. For God so loved me. And out of the love that he possessed, it caused him to give. How many of us, how many of us um, just go ahead and buy gifts for people you never met? How many of us just easily just do that? You just go buy gifts. You go buy an expensive gifts for people you don't never met. No? How many of us do that for a friend, though? Somebody you care about or a family member. Is that right? You are willing to give to the people you love. Now, truth is, 
indeed, we're supposed to love everybody. Is that right? We're supposed to love everybody. And I believe we can actually love everybody, but there's some persons who are dearer to us. Yes, and closer to us. But this is it. God so loved the world and his love caused him to give up his only begotten son. Not one of his begotten sons. His only begotten son. Who in fact was not just his only begotten son, but was the expressed image of himself. Ah. <laughs> so to think of it that he didn't just give up somebody, but gave up himself. Ah. Now we're right back at the word of sacrifice. <laughs> Giving up himself. Giving up himself. The reason why he gave up himself in the form of flesh, because in his original state, he couldn't die. Spirit could not be slain. Spirit could not be crucified, nailed to a cross and shed blood. So he had to make himself known in the form of flesh so that he could die for us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I cannot seem to wrap my head around this kind of love. I don't know if there's anybody here with the... IQ, the intellectual ability that you can somehow wrap your head around it and figure it out and explain it for us because it is beyond my understanding. Uh, such love, the songwriter said, such wondrous love that God should love. Then this is another part to it. God should love a Christian such as I. That God should love a saint such as I. That's not what the song says, right? That God should love what? A sinner such as I. Now, who is this God? He is the holy God. He's not a holy God. Oh, Lord. He's not a holy God. So he's not one of the holy gods among many holy gods. He is the holy God, the only wise God, and he chose to love sinners such as you and I when he is so holy, so perfect, absolutely perfect. Get that now. Not relatively perfect. So we have learned that there is relative perfection and absolute perfection. Relative per perfection speaks to one being perfect in certain aspects, but not all together. So what it simply means, and if we try to simplify it even more, is that you get some things right, but you still get some things wrong. Now, this God we're talking about, the true and living God, the only wise God, he is absolutely perfect absolutely holy there's no flaw at all in him oh my god and he has now catch this i don't want you to miss this I don't want you to miss this he has chosen to love us <laughs> he chose to love us nobody forced his hand to love us Nobody counseled him and told him, now listen, you see these people, you need to love them. There was no script written for him to say, God, you need to love the world. He has no counselors, no advisors, no instructors. 
He's self-existing. Oh, glory to God. And he chose to love us. Would you mind just lifting your hands and just saying thanks to the Lord for loving me, for loving me? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. So, his love propelled him to give, to give. His love propelled him to give. And then when he considered giving, he considered giving that which was ultimate. There was absolutely no better gift he could give to show his love. So you and I, if we have a friend or a family member, a loved one who is celebrating a birthday or some special occasion, we go to the mall, we go to some uh, store or maybe even a car mart and we look for a nice vehicle to buy for this person and we, we look for something special. Is that true? But guess what? We're not going to go to any cross and give up our lives for this person. Is that right? <laughs> Hello? <laughs> We're not going to do that. We're going to find something that we can pay for and give it to them. Is that right? Yes. Hello? <laughs> yes. But then our God didn't just look for something that he could give us for us to keep as a souvenir he gave himself he gave himself so baba said for god so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son and as we indi indicated earlier that his only begotten son is also his own express image it is himself god made known in flesh because number one who is god Chapter 4 of St. John in the 24th verse, God is a spirit. God is not a man. God is a spirit. But he manifests himself or made himself known in the form of flesh. And thus this manifestation is referred to as his son, his only begotten son. So God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son or gave himself that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life the question is do we believe in him don't put your hand up. I'm going to ask a question, but don't put your hand up. Do you believe in God? Answer within. Don't answer without. Do you believe in God? Do we believe in God? Okay, so I can now assume that the answer of everybody under the sound of my voice would be, yes, we do, I do, I do believe in God. If we truly believe we will act upon our belief. All right, so everybody's seated on a chair right now. How many of you took your chair up, examined it to, examined it to make sure it's intact before you sat down? How many of you did that? Raise your hand. How many of you checked your chair before you sat down? Nobody did. You know why? There is a level of confidence that we have that at Mount Zion, the place is cared for. The furniture placed here is all good. So we come and we're confident 
we have that confidence, that trust, that they would not put broken chairs here and tell us to sit on it. They would give us the best. Isn't that so? So we believe in the management of this premises to the end whereby we come night after night and we just find a seat. When in fact, one of the chairs could be broken. But we have such confident, confidence in the ability of those who care for this premises, who manage the affairs of this premises. Is that right? When we truly believe in God, we're going to leave all things in his hands. And we're going to act upon whatever he says. When we truly believe in God, we are going to leave all things in his hands and we are going to act upon what he says. Can we reason together a little bit? How many of us the Lord have instructed on many occasions and we, we rationalize, we reason it out as to why we shouldn't do what God says? Anybody? Oh, okay. I thought I was the only guilty one in here. <laughs> so many times the Lord instructs us and we start wondering and looking at the logics. And logics is usually one of the greatest opposition to faith. Because acting in faith is not always looking sound. <laughs> Hallelujah. So, he that believeth on him should not perish. So, if we believe on him, we're going to do whatever he says. The scripture bids us to understand uh, in the book of St. Mark, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth and is baptized. So, believe, then act upon the belief. If you truly believe, you're going to say, yes, I want to be baptized in the name of Jesus. If you believe, you will want to act upon the belief. Amen. Let's go quickly to Romans chapter 8, please. And um, it won't take you through the old chapter, but I want to highlight something from verse, beginning at verse 31. Romans chapter 8, beginning at verse 31. Romans 8, beginning at verse 31. If you're there, say amen. All right, let's go together, please. The Apostle Paul is addressing the church in Rome. He's addressing Christians, people of God. Okay? And so this is, in fact, applicable to us today because we're part of that same church. The church in Rome is a part of the same church born in Jerusalem. Okay? So it's not a different church. So one in Jerusalem, one different congregations, but one church. Are we agreeing on that? So let's go from verse 31. We're taking an excerpt out of what Paul had to say in chapter 8 of Romans to the church in Rome. He says, what shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? And we must qualify this who can be against us. It's not that no one will oppose you. It's that no one will prevail against you when God is for you. So we will have oppositions. We will have that. But none will prevail. 
with God, we will always be victorious. Somebody say always. 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 It won't always feel like it. It won't always look like it. It won't always sound like it. But it will always be so. In the 28th verse of the same chapter, the Apostle Paul had indicated to the Romans, he said, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. All things work together for good. So we do not like sicknesses, but they work together for our good. Sometimes it's in the bed of affliction that we are more penitent before God than any other time in our lives. And it's not that, I don't think it's a, it's a case where God finds pleasure in allowing us to be afflicted. But from time to time, the Lord has, has to give us something to keep us in check. The same Apostle Paul spoke concerning a thorn given to him. He said, lest I should be exalted above measure, there was what? Given to me what? A thorn in the flesh. The messenger of Satan to do what? Buffet me, to bombard me. Yes? Lest I should be what? Exalted above measure. So what was that doing for Paul? Keeping him in check. So even when others were telling him, oh, Paul, you're great, inside he knew, I'm not great. Verse 32 of Romans 8. He that spared not his own son, but did what? Delivered him up for us all. Therefore gave his son as a sacrifice for our salvation, for our deliverance and our protection. The word salvation deriving from the Greek word satigria, which means protection and deliverance. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? The Bible asks, the question comes in verse 33, who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Verse 33, if I may just read that in the New Living Translation, it says, who dares accuse us whom God has chosen for his own? No one, for God himself has given us right standing with himself. So then, it's not that you and I have somehow gotten ourselves in right standing with God. It is God who worketh in us. Oh, hallelujah. And without him, we just cannot make it. Have you ever heard this old time chorus? Another hill and sometimes a mountain. Another road with rocks to pierce my feet. But with Jesus to go along beside me, I will make it. There will be no retreat. Somebody say hallelujah. Hallelujah. Verse 34, it says, Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. So the man Christ Jesus, oh my God. So you and I may think that, oh, we're praying people and we're praying, we're praying, we're praying. But tell you what, there's someone interceding for us that make our prayer much easier than you think. So we think we have it so hard to pray. But guess what? There is the mediator between God and man. His name is Jesus and he is constantly pleading for us. Because of God's holiness, we should have been wiped out long ago. 
But I hear the old time song says, mercy rewrote my life. Or do I have any witnesses here who can stand and say, thank you, Lord, for your mercy? Oh, just a few persons have experienced God's mercy. I wish all of us would have experienced God's mercy. Do I have any witnesses here who can stand and say, thank you, Lord, for your mercy? Hallelujah. Your grace and mercy brought me through. I'm living this moment because of you. I want to thank you and praise you too for your grace and mercy brought me through. You may be seated. So here comes the big question. Paul again is writing to the Romans chapter 8. We're now at verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Now, let, let's get into a little bit of intricacy here. The question is asked, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? You and I understand from the English language that the pronoun who would be referring to a person not an issue, not a circumstance. From our perspective, we would understand better if, we, if the question was, what shall separate us from the love of Christ? But the scripture says, who? <laughs> now, to show you that it's not talking about a person. Paul continued in the same verse. He said, shall tribulation. Now, tribulation is not a person. Shall or distress. That's a what? Or persecution. Or famine. Or nakedness. Or peril or sword. But listen to this. It may help us to appreciate it. So when Paul used the pronoun, who shall separate us? And then highlighted these, these uh, circumstances such as the tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, or sword. I submit to us today, and possibly it could be further explained, but let me put it in a simple way that I believe we should look at it from this perspective. I believe that these situations, they are spirits. And the fact is, oh God, spirits oftentimes take on personalities. Oh. Oh. Mm. In the New Living Translation, however, this is how it is posed. They didn't use the word who. But what it is, what sta what's it sta is stated here, can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity? or are persecuted, or hungry, or destitute, or in danger, or threatened with death. Name me one thing that can stop God from loving you and I. Name me one thing that can stop God from loving you and I. I know I'm not in Jamaica, but there's a song that used to be on the radio. I've never been to a party or anything, but I used to hear, Can't Stop Loving You, I've Made Up My Mind. You ever heard that? Some of you are from Jamaica then. <laughs> Who sing it? Oh, sister, you know them. Hey, man. <laughs> Hallelujah. But name one thing that can stop God from loving you and I. Yeah. 
So there is absolutely nothing, hallelujah, that can separate us from the love of Christ. Tribulation cannot. Distress cannot. Persecutions cannot. Famine cannot. Nakedness cannot. Peril cannot. Sword cannot. Nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. Hallelujah. And there were times in the past when I thought based on what I was told or heard preached and taught I really grabbed it that it was my love for him so I supported the utterances such as nothing is gonna stop me from loving Jesus comes what may I'm gonna love him for the rest of my life and afterwards, when I start reading the word and understanding the word, I realize it's not my love. Hallelujah. But it's his love towards me. Oh, God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I wish, I wish our hearts could get broken today. That's what I would love to accomplish, that we get broken before God. To be honest, I, 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 I love excitement. I, I know how to be excited and I love it from time to time. But, you know, in recent times, as I draw closer to 50, <laughs> there are some things that I'm becoming more aware of. <laughs> Praise ye the Lord. And I've come to realize that of all the exciting times I've had in church, none of them has ever made me a better Christian. Wow. I've, I've had many exciting times in church, but none of those exciting times have made me a better Christian. Or a better person. It is when I apply the word. It's when I maintain a communion with God. That I recognize. And so. Back to the text. Paul continued in verse 36, he says, as it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. So we are in daily submission to God. Hallelujah. For his name's sake. Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors. What things? In the tribulation, I, 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 I am going to solicit responses in each, in each situation mentioned. If you have been through any sort of tribulation, little or much, I want you to respond accordingly. What Paul said in verse 37, nay or no, in all these things we are more than conquerors. Therefore, in tribulations we are more than conquerors. And I want you to get a hold of this now. It's not that in tribulation we are conquerors. But we are more than conquerors. Oh God. Oh God. You see, in conquering, yes, you win. Yes, you win. 
but you are more than just a winner. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yes, you got the victory, but you are more than just a victory. More than just a victor, rather. The fact is, in tribulations, we are more than conquerors. Anybody ever been distressed? We are more than conquerors. Hallelujah. Anybody ever been persecuted? But we are more than conquerors. Anybody ever gone through famine? Maybe not natural famine, but could be any other sort of famine. Deprivation of uh, maybe spiritual famine. Who to tell? Nakedness. We are more than conquerors. Where you needed garments to wear and couldn't find what you needed to wear. Peril or sword. The Bible said, nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors. Not by ourselves, though. Not because of our intellect, though. Now, fasten your seatbelt. Not because we pray hard, though. Not because we fast, though. Not because we preach and teach, though. But we are more than conquerors through him that loved us oh hallelujah so guess what if he never loved us we would not have been more than conquerors i wish even one person could jump up and give god glory for that hallelujah the fact is it's because of his love it's because of his love more time than my mind can conceive <laughs> praise god amen but we are more than conquerors through him that loved us hallelujah yes lord so is there anybody here at this very point in time for one reason or another maybe job related personal family some reason you're sorted down you just feel sorted down. Anybody at all feel sorted down. Something kind of on your mind and it kind of weighing you down a bit. Anything at all. Anything at all. Okay. All right. With all of what we are experiencing, have experienced and are about to experience through him that loved us, we are more than conquerors. So guess what? You may feel like you're going under, but you are not. Hallelujah. You may feel like you are going to uh, come to an abrupt end in your walk with the Lord, but you will not. Because through him that loved you, through him that loved me, we are more than conquerors. Let the church say hallelujah. Paul thought of emphasizing and deliberating even more. He said, for I am persuaded. Persuaded means he's convinced, he is sure, he is certain, without any doubt in his mind. I am persuaded that neither death, oh God, hallelujah, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come. Oh God, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Tell your neighbor something for me. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. 
Hallelujah. Turn to the person behind you and tell them or before you and tell them nothing can separate you from the love of God. It doesn't matter what the devil does. Hallelujah. Woo. It doesn't matter what Satan tries. He can't stop God from loving you. Woo. Can you imagine that before the foundations of the world, God decided to love you. It doesn't matter what you came out of your mother's womb looking like. Straight nose, flat nose, big head, small head, whatever you came out looking like. Whether you look very good, just a little bit good, or not so good. Everybody, he came to save the whole world. Hallelujah. So it doesn't matter what others think of you. God loves you anyway. Now let's go a little deeper. Even if you find yourself in a pit like Joseph, he will love you anyway. This does not mean that he's going to be just embracing anything and everything we do say and think. That's not what it means. So let's not get it wrong. And you know, no chastening of the Lord is joyous at the first. But be consoled about this. The only persons that God chasten, reprove, rebuke, correct, are those he loves. Ooh, hallelujah. Have you ever noticed in the book of St. John, the 15th chapter, have you ever noticed that it's only the branches that bore fruit were pruned or purged? Yes. The branches that bear no fruit, they were hewn or cut off and cast into the fire. But the ones that bear fruit, they went through a whole lot of rough stuff. Oh, glory to God. So sometimes you will get bruised because you're bearing fruit. And you know what? He wants us to bear more fruit. And he wants our fruit to remain. So the fact is, when you consider the fruit of the Spirit, the love, the joy, the peace, the long-suffering, etc., when you consider those nine elements the fruit of the spirit you understand that despite our circumstance our fruit must remain so it doesn't matter what we're going through we've got to keep on loving one another so paul says despite all these things None of them will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. None of them will. In 1 Corinthians, the 13th chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, The Apostle Paul is admonishing a part of his admonition, writing to the Corinthians. And he's highlighting love as the greatest. And I want for us to view this from two perspectives today. So it begins by saying, though I speak with it, let's read together please. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, which is love, I am become as sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. Now, sounding brass and tinkling cymbal makes a lot of noise. A tinkling cymbal, you cannot get a musical note or chord from a, a cymbal. 
It just tinkles. Yes? So unlike the organ, the keyboard, the bass guitar, you can play notes, you can play chords, but with the cymbal, you just get a loud sound. So one is called a splash, another one is called the crash, one is called the hyatt, another one is called the ride. And all they do is tinkle. They make a certain noise. <laughs> so without you and I, if we have rather without love, you and I are just as sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal, even though we can speak in tongues. <laughs> even though we speak in tongues. He says, and though I give, I have the gift of prophecy. Gift of prophecy, which means I'm able to prophesy. <clears throat> And that prophesying, of course, is twofold. Is either I can, well, maybe one or two, foretell and or foretell. Foretell, to preach, to declare, foretell speaks to predicting, speaking of that which is to come. So, though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity or love, I am nothing. So, I am absolutely nothing without love. And we could read through all of this. It says, and though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Charity suffereth long, and is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things, charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail, whether there be tongues, they shall cease, whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away, for we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. Paul said, when I was a child, I speak as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. And now abideth faith, hope, charity. These three, but the greatest of these is charity. And that word charity simply means love. Let's try to understand this. Because it is easy for us to assume again that all this is our doing. But it's not. So in 1st John chapter, chapter 4, chapter 4 verse 8, I think it is. Could you put that on the screen? Good. Let's read that together, please. What it says. Uh, let's go again. After two, one, two. He that loveth not knoweth not God. For God is love. Let's try to see if we can get a clear understanding of this. So, if we are unable to love one another, it simply means we don't know God. Because God himself is love. God himself is love. So for us to love, we need God.
So understand this then. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not God. Oh, you don't catch it yet. And if you catch it, grab it. <laughs> Hold on to it. Let's go again. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not God, I am become as sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. Oh, glory to God. I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge. And though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not God, I am nothing. It's interesting how we can accomplish some things that are quite impressive and not have God. So I've come to the conclusion that above everything else, above everything else, I need Jesus. Who, of course, is my God. Is there anybody here who need Jesus? You, you don't just want him, but you need him. I need Jesus. I need Jesus. The Lord has allowed me to fill some capacities in life that many persons see as great. But he took me there just to teach me a lesson. That all of that means nothing without him. So... If we have this world's goods and the fame, the titles and the names, and don't have Jesus, we're just nothing. I hear the word of God declares, man at his best state. Is altogether vanity. At his best state. So when we are at our best, we are still nothing. And that's why we need Jesus so much. Because he is everything. Hallelujah. 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 Sometimes we get very caught up in all of what we have to do that we forget him with whom we have to do. And if we be honest with ourselves, even in the church world and the workload that comes with church, we get so busy getting things done. That even our personal devotions are neglected because we're busy. And then we get so busy and out of that busyness, God gets sometimes very little glory. Sometimes none at all. But the crowd is satisfied. So we think it's a good job. But when God looks down, he said, that's not what I want at all. I need Jesus. I need Jesus. I need Jesus. We need Jesus. This has been a very good convocation. It has always been good. It has always been good. I've been here for couple of times, few times, and it has always been good. 
But I tell you what happened. If after it's all said and done, we go from here and nothing changes for us, then all of it would have been in vain for us who have not changed. Transformation needs to take place. Brothers and sisters, are we aware that we need Jesus? You know, oftentimes we don't really act like it, though. All of us, I'm not talking, I'm not speaking to you, I'm speaking to us, including myself. Oftentimes we don't act like it. We don't act like it. I'm afraid that we have become somewhat like Israel. Through the prophet Jeremiah, the Lord spoke to Israel and made them aware According to chapter 6, verse 16 and 17. Could we get that on the screen? Chapter 6, verse 16 and 17. Jeremiah, chapter 6, verses 16 and 17. Let's read it together, shall we? Thus saith the Lord. Stand ye in the ways, and see, and ask for the old paths, where is the good way, and walk therein. And ye shall find rest for your souls. But they said, we will not walk therein. This is the interesting thing. You and I today... We're not saying that from our lips, but our actions is saying the very same thing. Let's read verse 17. Also, I set watchmen over you, saying, hearken to the sound of the trumpet. But they said, we will not hearken. That's why sometimes I'm kind of fearful to be referred to as spiritual Israel. Because the Israelites in some regard were just so wayward. But I understand it to be appropriate in certain contexts. But in contexts like these where they are so outright. They rebel against God. They turn their back on him. so presumptuous and then when you flip that now to the love of God in the midst of all this idolatry that they practice which is also seen as spiritual adultery you know what God still loved them and the same kind of compassion is extended to us today. Where despite our neglect of that which he has offered to us and desire to see us attain, want to see us working toward and thriving for, Despite we turning our back on it all the time, he still loves us. So in closing, we get back to the main question. Who shall separate us from the love of God? I declare it today, nothing 
can and nothing will separate you from the love of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The Lord won't love everything we do. He won't love everything we say. He won't love all the thoughts we think. But he won't stop loving us. Hallelujah. 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 I am pretty sure that at some point in time, we have shown love to somebody. Mother, father, brother, sister, son, daughter. We have shown love to somebody, husband, wife, or somebody. Now, truth is, when we, when we attempt to show love, we do some things sometimes out of the ordinary. Are you at this point in time able to do anything out of the ordinary? Just to let the Lord know that you appreciate his love for you. Now note, I'm not saying to show him that you love him. Because believe it or not, our love is so limited. But if we can just show him appreciation for his love toward us. I, I, I want us to get a hold of this. In St. John chapter, I think it's chapter 14, verse 15. I hear the word of God declares, if you love me, this is what you're to do. Live by my word, keep my commandments. Live by my word, keep my commandments. That's what keep my commandments mean, live by my word. So I've come to realize that when I say, I love you, I love you, I love you, Lord, today, he's not impressed. Because I can sing that and not live this. When I, when, when I get singing and, oh, how I love Jesus. And it impresses everybody who looks on and we get teary eyed and we say, oh, we love Jesus. And Jesus is saying, but why aren't you living by my word? He said, if you love me, keep my commandments. So the question now is, what is it that we will do different today? To show our appreciation for his love toward us. Will we just casually say thank you Lord for loving me. And sometimes I know it's, it's our custom. We, we all do it sometimes. We say oh let's get up and give him our best praise. Our best worship. Our best shout. And the unfortunate thing. And please, um, bear with me. The unfortunate thing is that that which we call best, in God's eyes, is not what he calls best. Because what we call best is the loudest voice. How long we can hold out the hallelujah. We say, man, that's a good shout. But what God calls best is even a silent hallelujah that comes from a sincere heart. That's what he wants. So then I ask the question, what will we do different today? What will we do different today, church? What will we do different today? And one may think, well, okay, maybe we need to get down on our knees right now and pray and we start crying and so on. That would be nice, but it wouldn't be nice enough. What would be the best thing that we could ever do is to ensure we start applying the word of God to our lives. I was sharing with a few ministers yesterday and...
there is a great risk that we could possibly do church right and miss heaven. There is a great risk that we could possibly do church right and miss heaven. Chances are, as we sit here, we may be in our mind somewhere, or possibly on our phone or in our diary, we have already recorded the next special event that we need to attend. And we have been making preparations for that next event, but not necessarily for heaven. Lord, save us. Lord, save us. I don't know about you, but I want to be saved. I want to be saved. I want to be saved. And truth is, if it becomes necessary that I have to quit all the pastoral duties and all the ministerial duties just to save myself, I'll have to do it. I can't afford to miss heaven. There are many things in the world that I would have loved to be a part of. And I tried my best to avoid them because I said I want to make heaven my home. And then at the end of the day, to hear depart. No, I want to make heaven my home. Shall we stand? I won't try to tell you how to respond to that which we have shared. It's a choice that we will all have to make for ourselves. If I invite everybody to the altar, majority will come out of obedience, but not necessarily a convicted heart. If I ask us all to start shout some praises, majority of us will out of obedience but not necessarily true that we are convicted in our hearts that yes, I need to shout this praise right now. And I've come to realize that in sharing the word of God, the Lord deals with every heart individually. So while somebody may feel like falling on their face and reaching out to God, another might just feel like standing with hands raised and worshiping. Another may feel like go in a little corner and read the scripture through again and let it soak. Another might feel like falling on their knees in the altar. Somebody may just feel like finding a corner, lean against the wall and just start breathing the name of Jesus. So I am not going to try to lock you in a box to tell you, okay, everybody come to the altar or everybody raise your hand. No, I'm going to say, respond to the word as it appealed to your heart today. Respond to it. Go ahead and respond to it. We have a few minutes. We have about 20 minutes. Respond to it. Respond to it. Respond to the word. Not to your neighbor, not to me. Respond to the word. Respond to the spirit of God. While I was sharing with you, the Lord was also talking to you in various ways. So there are some things I didn't say that the Lord said to you that you just thought, oh, you know, this and so on and so forth. Some things came to you in all of this that nobody else is aware of. Now, you respond to God. Respond to him. Respond to him. Respond to him. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord.